put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. I got this either as a present or I got it on discount, so I did not pay very much money for this and am thus not bitter on account of that. Apocalypse PlayStation 1 video game review. Let's see if I can get this. up here there we go I'm going to do something unusual and not start with the plot because this is a situation where the manual of the game has a lot of let's go with backstory listed and I decided not to type all of it up since I can just read it directly from the manual instead of reading it directly from my notes so backstory Precursor to the apocalypse. The future is a troubled place of seething masses and conflicting ideas. Sprawling metropolitan landscapes cover the earth. These industrial gothic centers rumble with internal chaos and external strife. Religion and science have become the world's dominant cultural forces, each offering their own version of salvation. These two opposite pillars of life battle for disciples as humanity verges on the breaking point. Science seeks the answers to life in technology while religion condemns it as the sure path to Armageddon. For a while, science seems close to provide, proving technology is the answer to the complexities of modern life. Through the research of brilliant scientists, cloning, cold fusion, and nanotechnologies are no longer the stuff of science fiction. The miracles that science has promised are inevitable. Violently opposed to such progress is a mysterious figure known only as the Reverend. The Reverend is a false prophet who evangelizes his version of the gospel to a world teeming with lost souls. Desperate men and women latch onto his teachings by the billions. The Reverend preaches that the approaching scientific breakthroughs are an offense against the one true God and declares science to be blasphemy. He seeks to suppress all scientific progress as tools of Satan. With the President of the United States as a close personal friend, the Reverend succeeds in having all scientific research banned. The anti-techno dogma of the Reverend has prevailed. After eliminating all opposition, the Reverend proceeds with his true intentions. He turns to the same technology that he has publicly condemned to perpetrate evil. It is ironically, or coincidentally, the tools of forbidden science which will enable the Reverend to conjure up his own version of the apocalypse. He can no longer wait for Judgment Day to arrive. It must take place immediately. This depraved cleric is planning the deaths of billions in a grand genocidal event that will leave the earth in smoldering ruins. The Reverend tells his followers that the four horsemen of the apocalypse walk among them. Death, plague, war, and the beast are the heralds of the coming Judgment Day. The world is mesmerized by the Reverend and his fabled horsemen. Will Judgment Day truly arrive as he has prophesied? Only one man has an inkling of what the Reverend has in store for the world. He's a lone tech renegade on the run named Trey Kincaid. Trey is a brilliant scientist whose rebellious ideas and breakthrough work in nanotechnology have finally brought that fringe science beyond the prototype stage. At last, mankind is capable of creating complex machinery on the molecular level. Trey knew his experiments would one day provide the world with an answer to its prayers. But Trey's dreams are shattered when science is banned. The Reverend's thug disciples break into 
Trey's lab steal his research and massacre his co-workers. Trey is captured, but not before he learns the truth. While the Reverend was also decrying science as the work of the devil, he was also secretly following Trey's research. With the information his thugs have stolen from Trey's lab, the Reverend plans to use his newly developed nanotech resources to bring to life his own revelatory version of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The end of the world is at hand, and the only true hope for mankind's salvation is Trey Kincaid. Characters Mary Magdalene is a sexy rock diva with a global following. Her curvaceous body is always wrapped in skin-tight fashions of leather and automated nanofiber. Mary's performances burst eardrums and break hearts from Maine to Morocco. During the height of her popularity, Mary died under mysterious circumstances. Her corpse was stolen from the morgue by devoted fans, but she turned up several days later alive and well. Mary looked sexier than she had in years. Apparently, it was just the latest publicity stunt from rock and roll's most controversial siren. She's just as popular as ever, even as her once easygoing lyrics have taken a turn to the dark side. Some have accused her of delivering the reverend's fatalistic message to the unwashed masses. One thing everyone agrees on is that when Mary grinds her sinful curves against her guitar and roars to the audience about the coming apocalypse, Doomsday doesn't seem so bad after all. The President. As the leader of the world's economic and military superpower, the President of the United States is the most powerful man in the world. His rise to power was as surprising as it was meteoric. He was a humble mayor of a small southern city until he was befriended by the Reverend, who brought him instant, instant international recognition. He won the presidency largely on support given to him by the Reverend. The Reverend's millions of followers cast their vote for him after he was publicly endorsed as the only candidate who could save the country from drowning in its own moral turpitude. Ever thankful and indebted to the Reverend for bringing him to the ultimate seat of power, the President never makes a move without consulting his mysterious and powerful ally. Rafer. Countless wars have turned the world into an endless battlefield. Amidst all the death and mayhem, one man has reaped immense profits. Rafer is the biggest arms dealer the world has ever seen. His monolithic war factory alone produces more than 90% of all the weapons, all the world's weaponry. Rafer is constantly searching for the next high-tech weapon of mass destruction to satisfy the bloodthirsty demands of warmongers, gangsters, politicians, religious zealots, and street thugs. His weapons can be found everywhere from blood-soaked war zones to elementary school playgrounds because he's a close friend of the NRA. He feels no responsibility or remorse for his role in the carnage that his weapons have wrought. Rafer has no loyalty to country or ideology. Greed is his religion. Larry. Larry is a science prodigy and Trey Kincaid's faithful lab assistant at the science research facility. He's skinny, shy, and has glasses that make the lenses on the Hubble telescope look thin. Although barely past his teens, Larry is exceptionally gifted, dedicated to science, scientific research to the exclusion of all else. His family and friends worry that he doesn't get out enough. Larry's idea of hot and heavy is atomic fission. He is the ultimate gearhead. He shares Trey's vision and has pledged to devote his scientific skills to make the world a better place. Despite his genius level intelligence, Larry is still young and impressionable. Fortunately for Larry, Trey has taken him under his wing as he would have been easy prey for someone with less noble intentions. And I believe Larry was the character that was supposed to be the player character until they realized that people would just want to play as Bruce Willis, who plays Trey, not Larry. Plot. Let's see. Yes, a, a brilliant but evil scientist named the Reverend has created a powerful theocracy based on the idea of a rapidly approaching apocalypse. He uses expertise to create four powerful horsemen of the apocalypse, war, plague, beast, and death, in order to ensure this comes to pass. His former colleague, Trey Kincaid, voiced by Bruce Willis, is the only man with the know-how to stop the Reverend. But he is locked up in jail and must escape in order to save the world. Now, 
Yes, to, to quote from my own review from a few years ago, the story is simple, the conclusion is strange and unsatisfying, and the characters are minimally developed. But it isn't why you're getting into this, let's be honest. Now... That might be more or less what I'm going to quote from this section. Yes, every level opens with a quote. I think these are Bible quotes, but I'm not certain. And yeah, the rest of this section is not about the game. College Humor just put up for free on their YouTube channel a full episode of Hot Date, the TV show. Really good stuff. I honestly, I'd heard that it was a TV show long ago, just watching the sketches. I did not see how it could work as like full 22 minute episodes rather than just individual sketches as it otherwise is. But it did. I, I think they did a really good job. I mean, basically, you could say that it is almost a series of short sketches, but they're tied together in part by the overall theme, in, in, in part that this all does take place. You know, they're, all the stories are related. It's just now you have one scene with these characters, and then you have one scene with these characters, and, you know, it goes back and forth between the different ones. But all of them, it doesn't like jump like chronologically, for example, and doesn't have a ton of different, it's just, it's several different current or former couples, and it goes into this, all of the, all of what happens is tied to the, the theme of how, you know, how you relate to your exes, and how they relate to your current partner, and then also this theme of like keeping you know keep keeping your relationship interesting and not like ending up being boring or regretting things about your current relationship and yeah i mean if you took i love the sketches but if you tried to take just a handful of them and you know say oh this is all connected. I mean, it's connected in the sense that it's the same two characters and each sketch has them going on a date. But other than that, like a bunch of them couldn't possibly be taking place around the same time because of what happens in them. And uh, yeah. But yeah, really, Emily and Murph playing a couple or exes or the like, some of the best work that both or either do yet. Sorry, I'm gonna have to watch for the weather because there is sometimes thunder. And I'm not risking my computer on that. But yeah, you know, the the I love my elf girlfriend. And the first two, not the third part of the I am totally over my ex, here's me vlogging about my personal appearance. You know, how to cut your own bangs, how to turn your couple's costume into a singles costume, but not how to braid your hair like in Game of Thrones. And other examples of their great work together include why blowjobs are more intimate than sex, how to tell if you're a basic bitch, how to tell if you're a basic bro, I wish the dog would stop watching us have sex, this is every YouTube video ever, yeah, just keep them coming, you two. You're awesome together. And I really hope the Retard crew keep up with, you know, doing news with the cues. And from this point on, this section is going to be political. If you haven't already, make sure you watch Coughlin's recent video, The Alt-Right Doctor with ContraPoints. Awesome satire from start to finish. And make sure you watch Lindsay Ellis's the case for Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I love her videos. Meant to do that. Especially these recent analyses, especially the ones on Disney Animation. Though I will say, I also absolutely loved the one she did on the producers. And, and really, you know, Mel Brooks, 
making fun of Nazis in general and other people using satire as an excuse to, you know, promote Nazi ideas. Yeah. And Donald Trump's, Donald Trump Jr.'s hilarious Halloween socialism tweet really does underline the Trumps do not understand the concept of earning money. They think that being given something is basically the same as earning. And if you don't go out and personally get something, then you're lazy and not doing work. This, yeah. Now. Length. Now, this took me four and a half hours on this playthrough, and this was my second playthrough. I did not, I, I don't think I noted how long it took me on the first playthrough. Now, yeah. I mean, basically, I wouldn't have minded if it was like twice as long, but it is, I mean, at the end of the day, the concept does not allow for a lot. I mean, basically what you have is a series of settings that, in, in which the, the concept, excuse me, that I've already mentioned plays out. You know, this is not one of those games where there's a lot of plot and like, and so basically I forgot to set my Phone to silent. Let's see. And here we go. Now, I mean. Could there have been more settings? I guess so, but they do... I mean, I'll, I'll get into which ones they do have in the level design segment of this video. But, yeah, I mean, it didn't really... I suppose one thing, if it was much longer, it would have had to space out the various boss fights more. Because I'm not sure they could really have had many more boss fights than they do. Yeah, you know what? Actually, it's an appropriate length. No level goes on for too long. And really, none of them are so short that they don't make an impression at all. Which really, I mean, it would have been a wise thing to do to write down examples of this. But there are games where some of the levels are just so short that... Afterwards, you don't even remember them and that really sucks. It's it can be really cool to only spend a short period of time In a certain setting, but you still want it to make an impression, you know I'm replaying Assassin's Creed 3. No, I don't really know why either and the first Yeah, let's let's just call it level of that game is really really short but it still makes an impression you know, so it's, I mean, and, and in part it's really a tutorial. And, yeah, but, you know, the, the setting and the way it just, it, yeah, you, you remember it. It's sufficiently compelling. And, I mean, some of the boss fights in this get their own level and those levels can be really short. Because it's just the boss fight. And it's not one of those where it's a boss fight and then... You know, the boss runs away and you have to chase him down and there's some fighting with regular enemies and then you get to the boss again. No, some of the levels in this are just a boss fight and they'll take just a few minutes. You still remember them. Now. Characters. Now. Yeah, it features actor Bruce Willis provides the main character's likeness and voice, as well as being the first original game by Neversoft 
prior to launching their Tony Hawk franchise. And yeah, Willis's character Drake and Kay was initially meant to be a non-playable sidekick character, but his role was eventually changed to that of the main playable character, thus reducing the necessity for him to have as much spoken dialogue as was originally intended, as the scope of Willis's involvement decreased as development went on. In the finished game, Willis's vocal contribution are limited mostly to the occasional one-liner and a few brief lines of dialogue in story sequences, and Willis's map, Willis's face was photomapped onto Trey Kincaid's character model, but he didn't perform any motion capture work for the game. Really, who would think that players would be satisfied with playing next to an iconic action flick star? Everyone's <laughs> cool Marines. Now, of course, as Craig points out, this does leave him talking to himself when saying things meant to give the player a hint about what to do. At one point, he urges, I guess, himself to run as one example, and it's just, yeah, like, you know, he, he doesn't say, I better run, like you might have in, in that, no, he just, he says run, and that's supposed to tell the player character that, because he's talking to the player character, and yeah. Now, from the GameSpot review, and they gave it a 7.1 out of 10, Apocalypse is an ambitious project, Activision set out to make a shooter with a very action movie-like quality. Figuring that they'd need a big action movie guy involved to really make it fly, they got Bruce Willis on board. His face was scanned, his voice was recorded for the project. The theory being that Bruce would star and start in the game. The original plan was to have Bruce play your sidekick guy that would run around and back you up while you shot up the place. But it's then time dragged on, the conclusion was drawn that people don't want to be alongside Bruce, people wanted to be Bruce. So the side can idea was scrapped, and instead you take on the role of Trey Kincaid, science has turned outlaw. And... Yeah, the game's changed perspective may have been a good idea at the time, but it also caused the game's main problem. I don't agree that it's like a big problem, but whatever. Since all the voice work was written to work with Trey as your sidekick, it all sounds like he's talking to someone that isn't there. And I'm I'm gonna go ahead and quote this for the sake of you know have, having yeah, but I don't really agree with it. Plus, what they left in really isn't very really good. Most of the phrases like really lack feeling, and they're mixed horribly. It sounds like they just trapped Bruce in a bathroom with a mini tape recorder and got him to read the script. And, yeah, also the lack of variety, you'll hear, you'll hear open up a can of whoop ass and ooh, I feel good more than a few times, leads you to believe that most of the voice work was unsuitable after the transition, since getting Bruce back in the studio was probably impossible, hey, Bruce is a busy guy, we're left with whatever quotes they could salvage from the existing audio. And it, I, I think I also have as a note in here, others have pointed out, he will say the same thing more than once in an individual level. That can get kind of old, and it really, it needs, it's kind of like what, you know, what I said about Gex, the first Gex game, which is the only one I've played. I, sometimes he'll repeat the exact same thing, you know, in, in that it's, it's much worse than here, but... Yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't think it's a problem that he says the same basic thing several times over the course of the game, even many times, even once per level. But once he says it two or three times in a level, you know, it, it kind of goes from you feeling like you're, you're in an action movie with, you know, to reminding you, oh, right, this is a game that was made on a budget and they didn't have, you know, it's, it's, it does a reasonable job of randomizing. You know, I've, I noticed, for example, if you play through an area and you die part of the way through and you have to play back through it, he's not going to say the exact same things at the exact same times. You know, so it's not as though they just pre-planned exactly what, you know. I'm on record as saying that randomization, when done right, is one of the single best things you can do with the game. You know, it's one of the best things about the first Alien vs. Predator game, by far. 
you know, in, in a lot of respects, the second game is far superior to the first. But one thing the first does really well is randomize, where the second one, once you've played it several times, it's like, oh right, and then that enemy comes there. And especially when they make xenomorphs move from one part to another while the player is watching them, they will literally move the exact same way. And yeah, at that point it just feels, it doesn't feel like you're playing an action, it doesn't, yeah, playing a movie, it feels like you're just watching a movie that isn't, you know, yeah, I'm one of the people who don't particularly enjoy watching other people play stuff, you know, if it's a movie I want to watch, if it's a game I want to play, you know, now, yeah, I, I think that covers that. Now, my review, oh right, it's from 2010. That was when I first got this game. Trey Kincaid is a nanophysicist, not that that actually comes into play in, in this. Well, he's a symbol for the one side, I guess. In prison for his work, he committed no actual crime. And religious, religion versus science is the excellent theme explored here as the former has taken over, the latter has been outlawed. With someone known as the Reverend, the man who calls him a false prophet, that's evidently where, you know, they didn't, they didn't quite dare say that this was just religion. No, 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 he's a false prophet. So don't worry, religion isn't the enemy of science in reality, it's just that this particular one, you know, I, I like most of what they do with the Reverend, but I do kind of wish that, I mean, they're the one, they opened the door. They said, this is about religion versus science. You know, there are tons of games where religion is part of the, you know, the, the villain is very religious or the like, that don't say that religion is the enemy of science, but this does, and then they say, oh, but don't worry, this particular religion, it's it's not the right religion, so it's, it's okay. You know, it's, uh, yeah. But the... Yeah, let's see. Yeah, and, and some of the one-liners and cliches from this era of Bruce, among other Willis action movies, some of the some of it is dated and even corny. But you know, Bruce Willis can make almost anything sound cool. And yeah, that's the case here. And you know, just go with the idea of him being an egghead, even though he doesn't talk like one, behave like one, look like one, or anything, yeah. You know, he's he's a brilliant scientist in that he, I don't know, but he, he can use weapons and, no, you know, it's the stuff being used against humanity by the Reverend is Trey's work, but it doesn't really, like, there's no part of the game where you, like, have to reprogram a thing using his expertise. No. In the actual game, he's just, he's, you know, he can jump, run, roll, fire any weapon he picks up, and, you know, he's, he says one-liners. So, it's not very science-y. Science now... Yeah, and it genuinely does feel like a movie, like a big budget, leave your brains at the door, epic action thriller with supernatural overtones, kind of like end of days, only, you know, good. And it honestly convinces you that everyone in the freaking world is out to get you, something many games go for, but few succeed in. And... Yeah, and on one reviewer, you know, quotes, you know, when, when Trey's asked, how do you please, is, how do I, I plead as sticking my foot up your, yeah. And, let's see, yeah, and, you know, it's pure diehard Willis with all the cliches, you know, that's, I mean, that movie at least knew not to cast him as a scientist. He does, he sounds like this cop type who's, you know, yeah.
and let's see. Yeah, and a lot of people talk about the you know the awesome one-liners, and yeah, I absolutely love them. I love this game, and you know once you know even Duke Nukem looks like a joke compared to Apocalypse in the one-liner department. And no movie. And yeah, everyone has said that, you know, they wish this would be made into a movie and, you know, they were like, I wanted to watch the movie that it was based on, but then found out there wasn't one. And yeah, I mean, if they make this into a movie, you know, I mean, today it's maybe a little late for, you know, considering it, when did this come out? Like two, 2000 or something. But, you know, it's 1998, so yeah, you know, it's a little late, but I mean, last I saw, he still worked in action movies, you know, when, when put in an action movie, you still buy him, you know, let's see, Expendables 3, the, the, That, that Die Hard movie that wasn't very good. I mean, he wasn't, you know, yeah, I, th I think he still works as, as that kind of movie, yeah. Now, yeah, one of the things he says is kill them all, let God sort them out. On plot. Now, it is a third person shooter. I forget if I already said that, but. Let's see. Yeah, and initially it was a more, am more ambitious than it ended up, and it turned out to be too ambitious for PlayStation hardware and yeah the you know originally it was being made by Activision Santa Monica but then Neversoft was brought in they streamlined the gameplay to be simple run and gun shooter and you know made the change that Willis is the player character not the sidekick and according to Wikipedia Neversoft also ported MDK to the PlayStation 1 and excuse me since this they've done Excuse me, Tony Hawk and Guitar Hero games, and they also did a Spider-Man game in 2000, which I'm not. I may have played the demo. It it was fine, and the revisionist Western-themed gun in 2005. And personally, I like this a million times better than MDK. That game has such a mismatched tone, and so much of it is just yeah. I I. I can't imagine ever playing that game again. And this is coming from someone who loves the first Earthworm Jim game. So, you know, I and and you can you can tell that they definitely they they had cool ideas and it's definitely the same people who made Earthworm Jim with a lot of the comedy, but yeah, that that game. Yeah, but I already did a video on it, so I'm not going to get more into it here. Now, Apocalypse features several songs from various artists, including Poe and System of a Down. Technology developed for the game allowed live-action music videos from these artists to be projected on large screens within the game's environment. And, you know, at times it's somewhat reminiscent of the Blade Runner huge ads. And the Apocalypse game engine was reworked for use on Neversoft's next title, the seminal Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. At first, it might sound 
like, you know, that kind of developer would be wrong for this kind of game. But really, both have cool rock music, both are about making teens feel like they're awesome badasses, both are about intuitive controls and good control of movement. It, it does end up making a lot of sense. You know, the, the big difference is that it's a lot darker, gorier, and, you know, I mean, the themes explored are a lot more com complex. And I'm not saying that it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a game that doesn't explore themes. Not every game is supposed to. And, I mean, I'm not into, you know, extreme sports and such, but I mean, there are, there are games that I love that I, you know, that, that aren't, you know, at all, like, super complex on any kind of, you know, I, I love the, you know, Wii Fit and Wii Fit Plus, so it's not, you know, yeah. I never thought that it was, that, that, that the Tony Hawk games were bad, but I did at first think, how, how do you, how does, how does, like, if, if the Wii Fit people had developed this game, that would be completely weird, but, yeah, for the, you know, yeah, for, for what it is, I, I'm just, I'm really glad that this isn't, like, toned down to be, I mean, I don't know about the Tony Hawk games, but I imagine they're probably playable for all ages, and so you might worry that, you know, they tone down this kind of, not at all. This is very over the top in, in all the right ways. Now, already having in mind that they were going to begin work on Tony Hawk following completion of Apocalypse, the team said they had developed rough, rough in-house playable demos of Trey Kincaid skateboarding around Apocalypse's game environments in order to experiment with the way they wanted Tony Hawk to feel. Even though Neversoft continued to develop and evolve the engine primarily to suit the needs of the Tony Hawk series, it was also put to use in another action title by the team, the popular Spider-Man game that released in 2000. The aspect of the engine that allowed for the live-action music videos to be displayed within Apocalypse's game world was also utilized in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater as well as the as other subsequent Neversoft titles. And I can totally see how it would work really well there. And that again, if they had used it poorly in this, it would have been really obnoxious. But it's not, there, some parts of this game actually do have this kind of ads playing. And it's this, like, it's, it's very Blade Runner in parts. It's this really, like, you know, positive and like, you know, in, in 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 the original Blade Runner, you have this, you know, this geisha smiling and trying to sell you some product. You have these neon signs kind of thing. But then you have this perpetually rainy, grungy, nasty, you know, way too crowded kind of, you know, metropolis kind of setting. And in this also, everything is dark. But then you have these you know, ads with, with bright colors and such. It's, it's this, I, I hope, intentional, really, really fun contrast kind of thing, which, I mean, that is, like, it's, today I wouldn't say the contrast is quite that great, but, yeah, there are sometimes, you know, these ridiculously over-positive ads. Yeah. Let's see. Gameplay. Let's see. Now, the... Let's see. Yeah, Apocalypse is a 3D multi-directional shooter. The character is moved using the DualShock controller's left analog stick and shooting is handled independently by pressing the right stick in a given direction, which automatically fires the current weapon in set direction. You can also play this using the, you know, the four directional, you know, I forget, yeah, the, the pad. But it's, uh, yeah, and, and you can fire the your weapon in the f four direct directions with the, you know, square, triangle, circle, cross, but there won't be a lot of 
you know that that sacrifices a lot of the you know especially for the shooting you can't i i don't think at least i don't think you can well even even if you could you you know like if you held down two of them shooting like in the middle section between that looked a lot more sexual than i intended to you know shooting in between the the point that yeah that still wouldn't still wouldn't give the freedom that the the actual stick does and yeah i would definitely recommend using the the stick both sticks instead because the camera will yeah the, the game will kind of actually i'd have to say i i haven't played that many shooters on the playstation where it is like i mean there, there are different kind of shooters there are shooters where you don't actually really have to aim where the aiming is to you know I would play a game like Raptor, Call of the Shadows, on the PlayStation, but I wouldn't, I, I hate playing, you know, like, I have the game Oni. Up there, let's see, is this the right? Yeah. I have the PC version. I do also have a PlayStation 2 version because the PC version sometimes, I, you know, uh, over the years I've had more than one computer, rarely more than one at the same time and several of these computers cannot play the PC version and that's you know that's one of the arguments for going with console you know I have a PlayStation 2 that's what I play the PlayStation 1 games on as well and on that I can always play you know the the PlayStation 2 games I have the you know aiming in that so annoying but in this, you actually, yeah, but but it is also because this is run and gun. You don't control the camera in this, which you do in Oni, and controlling the camera is vital for the melee combat as well. But yeah, you should have a mouse if you're going to control a camera that freely. Now, yeah, using the stakes is by far the easiest way to hit what you're aiming at, since you can adjust it by small degrees, not just by 90 degrees. Using it for movement also makes it easier to guide Trey since there are a lot of places where it's, again, not just by 90 degrees. And the game will turn the camera you know, around corners and such, and it can be slightly awkward. And, you know, the further along you get in the game, the, the more frequently, and it never gets to be that frequent ever, it will sometimes ruin your jumping. You know, early on it barely happens at all, but it got close. And, you know, it, what the game will do, especially early on, is you usually don't have to jump right when it's turning, because that can really screw you up. Usually it'll turn right before or after you've made a jump, and that can kind of make, you know, freak you out a little bit. Oh, right, this, I didn't expect that to happen, but yeah. And, you know, it's like if you're playing Nocturne. Don't move too fast, don't move if you're not sure what you'll move into, and be ready to stop moving at an instant. And, you know, there are a lot of enemies in front of you, so if you move one stick to one side to move away from them, while moving the other stick to the other side to shoot at them, yeah, you'll, you'll be doing that a lot. And that's so much more useful than just running side to side and thus only hitting the enemy when they're right in front of you and you shooting up, yeah. Now... And that is, I mean, the first time I sat down with it, you know, I figured... You know, I, I think I had read it, but I guess I forgot, because it is a little... You, you do have to adjust your mind to that. And if you're not using the, the stick, and I didn't at first, the first time I played it, I sat down and I was like, okay, I'm firing my gun, so I press cross. And I press cross, and the and he shoots back, you know, be behind him instead of in front of him. And I'm like, oh crap, the game's broken. And, I, and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And I look up the manual, oh right, to shoot in front of me I have to press triangle, not cross. And yeah, but the, the yeah. And, you know, you use the shoulder buttons to duck or jump, selection of, you know, select different weapons, and use smart bombs. 
now. Yeah, to the, the GameSpot review said the gameplay is surprisingly fun for a shooter of this type. And I'm not sure it's that surprising, but it is en enormously fun. And yeah, the controls are set up in a Robotron or Smash TV like setting. Analog is a must here. But the game has a running and jumping atmosphere more along the lines of ASC Games 1. And. Yeah, and, and the game's frame rate tends to fluctuate a little bit, but it remains fast enough throughout the game right up until the final boss. The final boss stage has some serious slowdown problems, which in turn cause some poorly judged jumps, which in turn cause needless, not to mention extremely annoying, deaths. Now... But yeah, and, and to quote my own 2010 review again, this is one of the reasons the word awesome is in the dictionary. It was put there a while ago, I know that. However, it was done because one day this and other creative ventures would be made and you'd need something to properly describe it. And yeah, make sure to dodge searchlights lest you wish to be pummeled with serious machine gun fire. And some of this is, will be from flying cars. And yeah, and there, you know, there's a prison, city, sewers. Yes, as Spoonie points out, there is, of course, one. But it doesn't suck somehow. And, you know, other areas with this sort of, you know, heck is, you know, the, the yeah, is, is spreading with, like, earthquakes and lava and such. And yeah, third person arcade shoot 'em up somewhere the carnage. That was the one that it most made me think of. And yeah, post apocalyptic dystopian metropolis with nifty futuristic arsenal and tech. And it, the gameplay is intense, addictive, and a ton of fun. And <clears throat> excuse me. I'd say that the game does enough with like the the jumping puzzles and you know bits where you have to shoot certain you know certain objects to proceed and such it's never only you shooting at people for too long and and in you know in, in a row without anything breaking it up, which, as fun as it can be for a while, will get stale. That doesn't happen here, because they always make sure to break these segments up with something else. And, you know, and, and sometimes it's just, yeah, you're shooting a lot of enemies, but you're, at the same time, you have to jump between platforms or, you know, the, the enemies you're shooting are behaving in a way that you have to reactor you know a lot of them are just going to stand in front of you and let you shoot them but then some of them are going to fly on jetpacks you know some of them are you know but some, sometimes they will appear instead of in front of you actually behind you and such and i would say mostly the game does a good job of not doing so too unfairly and frustratingly now, yeah, doors, platforms, enemies, puddles of poison goo, anything that is out for your blood. Nothing can stop you unless they kill you, and that might be a while. And... Now, when, when you do jumping, you can use your shadow to better tell where you land, making jumping much less frustrating than otherwise. It, not enough games let you do that, because it's just, it makes it so much easier to tell 
where you're going to be landing. And camera. And the GameSpot review again. The camera does a pretty nice job of presenting the action in an easily viewable fashion, but it isn't perfect. And he says the White House level is the biggest offender. Yeah, maybe, maybe some of the later parts of that level, maybe, yeah. And yeah, there's, there's one jump that's pretty bad. Other than that, they don't get too bad, I wouldn't say, overall. And yeah, overall, the gameplay is really intense, although the game as a whole is really quite easy. And the last two levels of the game are reasonably challenging, though. Yeah. And, you know, you, yeah, you cannot turn the camera. It will do, sometime, do so sometimes as you progress through the entirely linear levels. And sometimes it does kind of screw you over. And there are a few times where you can't properly see where you're going. And that really sucks, you know. But, yeah, that's... That's something that too many games that don't let you have a fully free camera, they, they kind of fail in that aspect. And yeah. And yeah, and one points out that your character and enemies are often very small and it's hard to see what is happening. And yeah, that is true. Although this Ryu did give it a Positive. He gave it a 4.5 out of 5. Uh, a user read from, from GameFAQs. You know, this is one of the games that does not have a lot of online reviews. At least not anymore. And, yeah, the, the, you know, it's, I think, it's probably one of the limitations of the PlayStation. Because that's, that's something you'll note, you know, playing this you know, when comparing it to other PlayStation games, PlayStation 1 games, there is a lot going on on screen at times. And it's like, well, like there, there were levels that made me think of like Medieval, which is one of my favorite games for PlayStation and otherwise. But in that game, as many enemies as you do sometimes fight at once, you know, that game has at least one, I forget if there's more than one, it's been a while, but it is on the list for doing more videos on another video on rather there there is at least one level where some you know where just for a little while okay now you fight enemies of this type for a little while and such in that game it is never as chaotic as it is in a lot of this and that's another thing i do want to say this gets right when it should be chaotic and when it shouldn't be and it does slow down in other parts where you get a breather, you know, but yeah, you know, the price of having that much go on was probably that they couldn't show it in that much detail. And they maybe also felt that, you know, if, yeah, and, and maybe if the camera was too close, part of it is also that sometimes part of what's going on is so far away. Either they would have to zoom out the camera specifically for those sections, and there are a lot of them, or it would have to just permanently be zoomed out. But yeah, you know, if it was very close, it would be very noticeable if it wasn't a very high level of texture and such. And yeah, given how far away the camera is, it probably isn't very high quality texture. And and the, the, the camera does sometimes zoom in a lot and sometimes zoom further out, but it tends to stay at one basic level most of the game. Graphics. Now, 
excuse me. Yes, and again, my own review, there are very nicely done CGI cutscenes, and they and this overall have a sense of humor. Uh, the graphics and animations, well, this was released for the original PlayStation, that was what I played on back then, hold up pretty well to this day with large 3D environments that you can move in any direction around in. And yeah, I mean, a lot of PlayStation 1 games don't quite today, yeah. But it's also, it's also a thing with, like, today I'm playing it on a TV that's, you know, yeah, you know, it, a, diff, a TV that is of a higher, I don't remember what it's called, more, more inches resolution, whatever. I'm, I'm not really, I, I like playing games and watching movies, but I don't know that much tech stuff of it, but yeah larger than it was than the one I played it if, if I had played this in 98 you know I remember playing PlayStation games back then and yeah it was you know smaller TVs and that's also a thing when you're playing it today although it is thankfully one of the cases where you can actually still play it others say the graphics are superb but it's still awesome The graphics are excellent. I think the background is especially well done. A lot of stuff happens that show the graphical powers of the game. Maybe walking in a street and suddenly there's a big explosion, you fall in a big hole and the stage continues in that hole. Or you're on top of a building, blow the roof off with a rocket launcher and a hole appears. You jump in the hole and fall the, to the bottom floor of the building, from the roof to the bottom floor. There is no transition screen. And yeah, that's right. and sometimes there are FMVs playing on big screens in the streets, and it doesn't cause any slowdown. That's yeah, it's it's they did an amazing job there, and yeah, I, yeah, I'll get more into the yeah. The FMVs are cool in this game. Between each stage, you see a short FMV with your hero who shows the story. The story is quite simple and fun. The guy does look like Bruce Willis, but his face never moves. Used another actor and put Bruce Willis's face on him. And let's see. And uh, yeah, it is too bad. You a lot of the enemies you never get to see up close, and you know you you only really get a sense of what they look like. So yeah. And. Yeah, the, the graphics are dark, dank, and evil looking, so the fit the game's name. Yeah, and he says they don't have any flash, no gimmicks in this game, just plain easy to see guns, fire and Bruce Willis. I don't know. I, I'm not I don't really agree with you know No gimmicks. I mean the, the you know what what the other reviewer that I just quoted mentioned I would say quoted you know qualifies as gimmick stuff but yeah and the let's see yeah the characters look small but the explosions are big and meaty and the gloom of the city environments creates a good atmosphere of a world on the edge. And there are also several nice touches in the prison escape sequence. For example, the screens in the prison show a news flash detailing your escape, and they show the moment you break free of your cell. In effect, they show you the first few seconds of gameplay. And in the city streets, you can see vast TV screens playing music videos. And yeah, I do think that's really cool. Yeah, it's literally showing the news and it's you escaping and it's actually you escaping it's yeah and that's also something that too few games do you know there are so many games from this time you know not modern games where it's like wait that character in the cutscene is that supposed to be that character in the game because they don't look that much alike sometimes they don't even sound that much alike and yeah you know today actors do their own you know for Splendor Black was one of the reasons that they recast Sam Fisher 
is that I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. The the, the Michael Ironside cannot do today the would not be able to do the motion capture stuff you know where yeah in that game any movement you see sam fisher make that's the actor performing it and the the voice work that he does for cutscenes and the voice work he does for in-game dialogue yeah it's the same actor doing all that now some people don't like the graphics and Yeah, one person says, I, I don't agree with this, but one person says the videos they try to incorporate in the background feel out of place. And I mean, I, like I said, sometimes they create a contrast, but I think that contrast works. But yeah, not everybody agrees with that. And it's, you know, that's fair. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Wrong though it might be. I'm joking. About it being wrong. Now, one thing I really do, it's a problem about the cutscenes, and unfortunately this is a problem with a lot of cutscenes from back then. It's, you know, one, one game that really comes to mind is the, the third Prince of Persia game, which was the first to have voice at all, you know. I cannot make out a third of what is said in the cutscenes, you know, especially because some of them speak in this modern, you know, like the the like the, the the horsemen, they won't just have a deep voice. No, they'll also have this weird like filter going on. And certainly, the reverend does, and you know, and, and some of them also speak in a slightly weird accent or something. And yeah, because of that, you know, I, I should clarify the the. Actually, no, that was what I meant to say. Never mind. And the lips barely move on the characters, which is just a little. Yeah, you know, you have these big detailed cutscenes, and then the lips don't move much at all. And then, if you, if you, I'm gonna try to stop doing that, saying a thing, and then immediately saying the same thing afterwards. If you increase the volume for the cutscenes to be able to hear what is being said at all, then you immediately have to lower it right after the cutscene. I just. I don't know, maybe the technologies just did not allow it for, for it back then, but it's super annoying, nevertheless, and yeah. I, I forget, I think the, yeah, the, the, it was a review I read of the third Prince of Persia game. You know, you'll, you'll be several seconds into the first cutscene, I forget if you said you had to increase or decrease the volume, wondering who said what. And yeah, that's... But yeah, the cutscenes are fully animated, but no lip movement on... Certainly not on Bruce. I don't think there's lip movement on anyone, but I could be wrong. Audio. Now... The game's sound is quite, is it, yeah, this is from the GameSpot review, the game sound is nice. Fire explosions give the game a feeling of a real battlefield, that's very true. Whoosh of the flamethrower is especially nice, the music is also well done. I'm going to track by Poe, that's how long this game has been in development. When they first announced Poe's involvement, it was a reasonably big deal. Who also plays a part in the game, if you happen to read the I, I would suggest you read the GameSpot review after completing the game because the review actually spoils who the... yeah. Now... Yeah. yeah and for my review, this has Kick-Ass Tunes 2. It goes into heavy metal with Mary Magdalene, and this portrayed by Poe, here and there. And the sole problem with this is the poor job they did making the change from one track to the next subtle and smooth. It's very, very clear when they're changing from one to, to the other, and yeah, other than that, I absolutely love the music in this. The music's pretty heavy, it suits the... it keeps using that word. Is, is there something wrong with the gravitation? Oh, whatever. If it's the carnage 
atmosphere well. Sometimes a heavy metal band playing on a big screen, you can listen to their music and watch their video while killing people. Explosion. Explosion sounds are pretty standard stuff. I don't know. I thought they were really good. And let's see. Now the music was excellent, an incredible score. Music itself is quite suited to the gameplay. Moody rock tracks and occasional vocal vocals really help the atmosphere. The sound is top notch. The sound effects are very realistic and very clear. Voice acting is also very good. Besides, let's see. Yeah. And that's one thing, the, the, the PlayStation 1 was one of the first consoles to have, to, to actually double as a CD player. You know, if you just turn it on and you, you know, if you don't put a, a disc in, yeah, it's, you know, you can, you can check the memory card, you can use it as a CD player. And if you put a disc in that isn't a PlayStation 1 game disc, you know, it, it might say it doesn't recognize the disc. If you put in a CD, you can play that CD and it works as, you know, I mean, today it's, you know, Phalus made that joke about, you know, CD players, that's what we used to have before we had MP3 players. But yeah, you know, and because of that, it can play these big, fully animated cutscenes and it can have these full songs, you know, where you know, console music used to be very limited. It's, you know, well, PC ones as well. But yeah, this one, the, the PlayStation one really allowed for that. And this is one of the games that really uses that well. You know, there are a lot of games that don't utilize what the system that it's made for can actually do. And yeah, I, this, this one does really well. Weapons. Now, when you've spent all your ammo from one weapon, it switches back to the infinite ammo one. So if you're in a big fight, you won't just go through all your weapons. And you know, you can always switch to a weapon that uses ammo. It takes more focus to switch to the only gun that has infinite ammo than to switch away from it. And yeah, again, it, too many games get this wrong. Now, you have a, ma a machine gun which has infinite ammo and, you know, the, the manual says it's the least powerful but most reliable. Personally, I used it almost all the time, save the bigger guns for boss fights and such. And a pulse laser with rapid bursts of lethal green energy, not pink, kill them with greenness. It's great for quickly dispatching hordes of enemies but you can't fire it for very long without running out of ammo. And... And a flamethrower, 30 foot flame shot at your chosen target. Enemies hit will combust into a fiery ball. And a homing missile, which, you know, ideal for nailing those hard to reach enemies, seeks out the nearest hapless enemy with a vengeance. And there are parts of the game where you want to use. There, there were parts of the game where I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to use the heat, you know, the, the homing missile, and yeah, it it really, it's 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 incredibly useful. It really works. There are way too many games where the supposed homing missile does not work well, and it's super annoying. And yeah, here it, it absolutely does. And it's also incredibly useful in several of the boss fights. The particle beam fires a fatal orange beam energy that can cut through almost any opponent. It's so powerful it can slice an enemy in half. And the RIP laser, which fires purple, I'd say they're more, more teal, but whatever. Arcs of lightning electrocuting enemies, effective in taking out solitary enemies. A rocket launcher and a grenade. And let's see. 
And, you know, when you fire a weapon, but also when you jump, when you land, you know, when, um, obviously, when you're hit by an enemy, that's, that's what a lot of games do. That's where the, the game makes really effective and liberal use of the vibrating joystick. Again, something that too many PlayStation 1 games just didn't know what to do with. And just, yeah, I, I distinctly remember starting to play the PlayStation in, I think, 99. And, like, thinking this, you know, I mean, that was, that was a thing. You would, like, I don't have the cover of the game right here, but... You know, you take a PlayStation 1 game, you, you look at the back of the cover, it'll say, you know, so and so many players, you can use a memory card to, to play, you know, it'll say if it does or not. And then it might say vi vibration compatible, so something like that, you know, and every time you found a game that was like, there's a, yes, I got it, you know, I, I hope it uses it well, and this is one of the games that really use it well. You can really tell when you're using something, you know, a heavy weapon, something about really high caliber. But in general, just you can really tell if you're firing a weapon or if it's one of the few quiet parts of the game where you're just, you know, just moving. And yeah, definitely, you know, there's... If a game has the budget to do it, it... Yeah, definitely go for, for vibration. I mean, there are probably people who don't like you know, vibration in games, you can turn it off. It's better to have it and be able to turn it off than not to have it at all. Now. You know, that's, that's why they do, they still do 2D screenings of 3D moves, you know, in addition to people who don't want to spend the extra money, of course, and then, you know, you're, you're free to do that, but yeah, you know, some of us want to really treat ourselves to something, and I, I'm fortunate enough to not get like sick watching, you know, no, I've, I've never gotten sick, motion sickness from watching a movie with an incredibly shaky camera, no matter how shaky. Not, not, no, no movie I've ever watched, no matter how shaky it got, gave me motion sickness. Now, and the, the lightning one also kind of auto aims. Yeah, and, and the, you know, if, if you do use, well, yeah, regardless of how you fire your weapons in this, whether you use the, the directional stick or the four, you know, buttons, it will not take you very long to get used to it working like that. And that's something you, you might think, you know, usually if you use the right directional stick in a, th in a third person shooter, you're directing the camera, and that's not at all the case here. But it's not going to take you many moments. You, know, you can you can just run a little bit back and forth. It when when you start at the game in the first level, just run a little bit back and forth, trying to shoot in all the different directions. You have infinite ammo. You have your infinite ammo gun already, and just you know test it out until you're comfortable, and then move on to the you know the the game isn't going to punish you for spending like 30 seconds at the start of the game. Just figuring out, and it's not going to throw enemies at you if you don't run out of that first room. So yeah, and the 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 smart bombs kind of create this radial burst of a force starting around you, and it's yeah, it can be incredibly useful. And it's again, it's it does the thing that too many games don't. It's a powerful weapon that you can fire close to yourself without taking damage from it. Too many games, you know, you don't want to use a grenade or a rocket if it if enemies are surrounding you. You you want to be able to destroy them quickly, but you don't want to cause that big of an explosion that close to you. And yeah, that's where the smart bombs come in. And the smart bombs, if you don't really use them, if you just store every single one you pick up over the course of the game, by the end of the game, you will have a lot of them. You know, this is this is like the anti-Oni in that regard. You, If you pick up a weapon in the first level and you never use it, you will have it at, you know, at the end of the last level if you haven't used it by then. And yeah, you can really store up. I, I greatly appreciate that because that is a thing where, you know, considering how difficult some of the enemies in this game are to fight, 
you know, you know, th this next boss is really going to destroy me if I don't store up some ammo for really big guns. You know, though the boss fights do tend to also have ammo pickups, but you still, it's, it's still nice to have, yeah. Plus, this game offers an array of weapons that keep this title interesting. And... Let's see... This one reviewer gave it a 2.5 out of 5 and said, Control in this game is almost patronizingly simple. I don't understand why it's a bad thing for it to be. It's not a game that's supposed to be. It's an arcade game, dude. Just, I, I, some of these reviewers, and again, that's perfectly fine. I kind of get the sense that maybe this game just isn't for them. You know, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not gonna like review a Tony Hawk game and say, the only thing you can do the game, doing the game is this skater thing. But, but this is not at all what I like to play. You just you know, don't don't play it. Or and and like this is something I try to do. If I watched a movie or played a game that just isn't really for me, I'm not just just gonna say that this isn't like the stuff I like. You know, I'm gonna try to just focus on the stuff that I. Because it's just, it's not that useful to anyone. It's not that useful to anyone to say this, I'm not the intended audience for this. And so here's all the stuff that just, yeah, you know, I mean, it can be, it can be entertaining to watch, but it's not going to be that useful as a review, you know, yeah, you're, you're not really telling people who might watch it if they, you know, I mean, if, if, Personally, I think it's on you to figure out, as a consumer, is this going to be for me? That's what trailers are for. You know, if you go into, like, I get people who watched Mother and said, this was nothing like the trailers, and I, I would have liked what the trailers promised, but I didn't like what I got. That's a fair point. You know, if, if the marketing lies to you, that's, you know, that's something to call out, although I still don't think it makes the actual product bad. But I get why it makes you, why it leads to a negative review from you. But if if something clearly isn't going to be for you, you know, I'm I'm not gonna play Just Cause Three and be like, this game doesn't abide by the laws of physics. It's just, yeah, you know, I mean, there are tons of games and movies that aren't for me. I tend to just not go to them, you know. Now. And again, you know, if, if, if your thing is, I want to make an entertaining review for people who, like me, aren't really, in, you know, aren't in the intended audience for this kind of thing, that's perfectly fine, you know, that's, but just, if, if you want your review to be particularly useful, yeah, nah. And then, I mean, I will say about this game, actually, wait, I, no, the, the standard, the standard PlayStation 1 controller does have s the dual stick, I think. I'm not sure they all have vibration, but I'm pretty sure they do all have the, the, st yeah, I, f I forget. But otherwise, again, I'm almost certain it's on the back of the cover for the, the game you know, supports DualShock controller, and if it supports it, you probably want to play it with that, you know. I mean, you, I could download on my PC a fighting game and use the keyboard, but it's probably, you know, probably makes more sense to use a joystick, you know, which is why I don't tend to play them on the PC. You know, that's, that's a console game, for sure. Ammo carries over to the next level, so don't spend it all in one place. I'm gonna check. Here we go. Got the game. Yeah, one player, memory card, one block. 
analog controller compatible and it even shows the the dual stakes yeah vibration function compatible so yeah you know if if you get this game you're going to yeah and it's you know for ages 15 to 17 or 18 plus it's not for anyone younger than yeah and i'm gonna have to put this down excuse me the dog was sick i had to put her down ai and enemies Yeah, the, you can probably get joysticks that don't have, or could, probably <laughs> hard to find today, joysticks that don't have the analog sticks and are cheaper than the regular, than the ones that do. I, I could imagine. And certainly there are ones that don't need. Yeah. Now. Yeah, and, and from my own view, somehow this doesn't get repetitive. Maybe it's that all the time you are meeting and killing new enemy types and they're often all over. You are against troops, don't feel guilty about killing them, they're full of misery and hate. Although they, you know, they will sometimes yell, my arm and I have a family, but yeah. You know, I mean, this is not a game that's supposed to send you into some like existentialist, like what am I doing, am I really, should I be killing, no, no, no. It's robots, the undead, tanks and choppers, there are no NPCs that you shouldn't take apart. And the AI is great. They'll follow and try to get to you. Try to get you. There's nearly constant bloody violence and disturbing content. And... Yeah. Let's see. And the game also has explosive crates. If you can see it on the screen, you can likely shoot it, and it will likely explode or die. What do you mean, what do I get out of it exploding? An explosion, possibly several. And enemies will explode into chunks when you kill them, and blood spurting. Yeah, and some of them will yell, don't shoot, I have a wife and kids. Yeah, that's really... But I mean, they do still attack you, you, you know, you don't have to kill every single enemy in the game, but, you know, you don't want to run around and not shoot at least the majority of them. And like the, at least the first Doom game, at the end of a level, the, which I probably won't be doing videos on, I'm, I, I'm not really planning on doing videos on, you know, 90s first person shooters. I, I liked some of them back when, back in the 90s, but, you know, I, I certainly do still, I, I, if I sat down right now and played Duke Nukem 3D, I'd enjoy myself, but yeah, not, but, but yeah, like, you know, Doom, at least Doom 1, at the end of a level, it'll tell you what percentage of enemies you got, so yeah. Boss, enemies, and battles. And, yeah, let's see, the boss fights don't tend to be gimmicky or forced, and they can be pretty challenging, and, uh, yeah, you know, there are, of course, the, the four horsemen, although, yeah, I mean, I, I knew them as, you know, let's see, war, death, Famine and strife and you know famine is now plague and strife is now beast. So Let's see And Is it challenging? 
Now, you you do have, again, quoting from Rolleru, you have extra lives. Only if you run out will you have to start a mission completely over. And yeah, and it resets the amount each time you complete one and it lets you save after the end of any of the levels. And let's see. And yeah, and if you if you don't run out of lives, if you just die during a level, you'll respawn at the most recent checkpoint, meaning that you never really have to replay too much, although of course, if you play it on a very high difficulty setting, you will, you know, you might end up dying, you know, running out of lives late in a level and have to play the whole thing over. Now, right, here it is. On my first playthrough, I completed in under four hours, so yeah. And yeah, there are three difficulty settings, no high score. You know this, and and the game has eight save slots, and it does not force you to save, which is also a thing I greatly appreciate. I, I'm not gonna say it's a bad thing about a game like Oni because that game is supposed to really push you to the limit. It's supposed to be difficult, but a game like that, you you don't get to choose whether or not it saves. So if you're replaying a part you know, for whatever reason, and the, the, this time when you get to, you know, when you complete a level, for example, or just, yeah, when you make it to the next checkpoint, because in the, that is also something I really do love about that game, you can replay any checkpoint. You don't have to start over at the start of the level if you, but yeah. If you reach a checkpoint and you had less ammo, less health than you did the last time you reached that checkpoint, it will still overwrite and yeah I really appreciate that this doesn't do that now and, and you know it does also reset to, to yeah let's see or at least it did on the difficulty setting I, I don't play on the highest difficulty setting not on games that I'm not super certain that I can you know where I can complete personally it's just to me I don't want to get really far in the game and then reach something that I can't get past because I had it at a too high difficulty setting now but I mean you know I, I have completed the first day as X on the highest difficulty setting at least once so you know I don't never do it and yeah, I mean, the, the game would be really frustrating if you had to restart the whole level any time you died. It's, it's, the, the checkpoint system is really great. The, the game would be intolerable if it was that intense and didn't have a checkpoint system. And, you know, respawning at a checkpoint may refill your health, depending on the difficulty setting. Now... Let's see... Critics... Users... Let's see... And I think all of these are going to be from GameFAQs. And I have already quoted parts of these reviews, but this is stuff that didn't really fit in any other section. Huh, never mind. Level design. Yeah, the you know, levels include sewers, factories, rooftops. And the prison has bottomless pits. And again, the 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 person writing that review wrote like, "Why does it have? What do you mean? Why? It just I I don't think this game is for you, dude." And let's see. But yeah, you know, huge city, graveyards, 
And I think that kind of counts as a spoiler, so I'm not going to say that. And... Yeah, some levels will have platform sections that can be hard and frustrating. And again, I'd say most of the time it doesn't push it too far. But maybe it does on the highest difficulty setting. And there's some Blade Runner going on in the city design. And I think that covers the non-spoiler parts. So... Lots on. Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Now, yeah, and this first level has this short cutscene before you get to move setting up the story. But once you, you know, it, it took about four and a half minutes before I got to move. And then right from the start, it's fast paced, you're dodging enemy fire and gunning down plenty of enemies. And, you know, less than seven and a half minutes in, um, I've done three platform jumps, and there's more jumping, and at this point, none of them too tough. Some large open areas with few enemies, me running along catwalks with enemies further along on the catwalk I'm on, on platforms, some of which I can jump onto, some far off, some behind windows who shoot out, and some tight enclosed areas with many enemies from all sides, cell blocks, corridors, and connecting areas. And you know, so far, every enemy is a large blue guard that shoots green spheres of energy at me, or is a prisoner who comes close and uses claws. And the few enemies who are off screen as I shoot, I can target by lining up, you know, lining up with their shots at me. And the end of the level has a massive tank attack with a flamethrower and drives side to side, then forward along the edge of the square area. I have to stay far away, but keep moving to keep it in my sights as I fire. And that is one of the cases where there's a boss who isn't a horseman. And it would have been too little if the, you know, let me think, what is this? Uh, 11, 13 levels, something like that. If there's only four bosses in all of that, yeah. And level two of the sewers. Let's see. Yeah, and enemies are throwing grenades, and I can't stay in one area for long or I'll get hit. I'm chest deep in sewer water. The sewer's almost immediately open to a huge cavern, and these toxic waste barrels, blow up barrels, shoot pillars, and are supports to knock over grates to proceed, and some waterfalls and flushing streams of water. I have to jump over several flames that spew out, and I mean, I guess if I was supposed, if I were to f try to find a realistic explanation, I guess some gas mains burst, but otherwise it's deliciously nonsensical. And you know, first I get to run towards them, then make the jump. Then I'm caught in a stream, pulled towards them, and you can see them from afar, so they don't suddenly start when you get near. You, you have an idea of how much you'll be jumping, as it should be. Certainly, on you know, at, at this point in the game, and on not too high of a difficulty setting, and you know, let's see. And you know, I'm jumping between large static platforms and bottomless pit beneath me, and these rocks fall onto a platform ahead of me, and I see their shadow warning me not to get too close. 
and some of them keep falling and I have to run past when they're not right on top of me and a lot of these platforms have at least a few grenade throwers nearby keeping me on my toes it's not just quote unquote just platform jumping and jumping via platforms down a huge pipe and I shoot these large crystals and now I fight giant rats so you know, must be New York and there's 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 actual lava you know just yeah and and some of it you can quickly jump back out of i i didn't really know if someone maybe kills you on contact i i i believe i died sometimes from lava but i think i might have just had very low health and not been quick enough to jump back out of it but and and some platforms that drop moments after you touch them very prince of persia sense of time trilogy and otherwise and now the stream is pushing me backwards into a bottomless pits while giant, while rocks fall and giant spiky balls that I can blow up come at me and the stream pulls me forward flames from side of me to dodge and the boss is a giant alligator and, and he goes above water attacks and he goes under and moves for a few seconds and I can't hit him when he's underwater but I do see air bubbles so I know where he goes and all weapons are useful against him now Level three, the city, and yeah, the level opens with the camera pulling back from, excuse me, back from a view of the city, through, excuse me, through a window into the room I'm in, and I leave out of the building and down, walk the streets, and get some searchlights, and the roads has holes into heck, you know, glowing red light up from down there. And I run the streets, shoot more enemies, and then I meet the TIE Fighters, the first of many, and just, yeah. I know they're not actual TIE Fighters, but they look a lot like them. I'm leaping down onto another street. Buildings were blown up to block the path in front of me by TIE Fighters. More holes into heck and flames spewing up. Small tanks, reminding me a lot of, like, the small hunter killers from Terminator 3. I shoot glass blockades, I get grenades, use one on a carefully planted group of enemies. Super effective. More tanks. And there's an ad on TV. And hard rock playing, really awesome. And the camera turns as the street does. And a TIE fighter that drops in a tank, really cool. And it takes some damage to blow up. Look down to another street. Two big tanks block the path. Fire blue plasma and flames at me. Take a bit of damage. Blow up. Leap onto another street. More tanks. And if, in, if I'm in the middle of the section, one of the tanks is in front of me and one of them is behind. Which, And that is, that's where it's a little annoying that I can't turn the camera to face the one behind me. And... And I leap onto another street and then flying cars with searchlights pass above, enemies jumping out onto the street. And I'm hard to make jumps over holes into heck. Immediately followed by one or more flying cars with searchlights go from behind me to in front of me, maybe drop some enemies in front of, behind, or around me. And some safe cars fly overhead. Dangerous jumps between static cars over open heck. And then they start moving, and yeah. I'm flying on top of one, spraying fire on both sides, dodging missiles from a flying car behind me, and the ground next to me is gone. Heck, as far as the eye can see. I climb a building in front, jumping into and climbing up the ledge, and then for a little bit it's a 2D side-scrolling shooter. I really love when that happens in this game. And two levels to it. And I walk the upper one, not the lower one. And one on the ground and jump back down when I reach the end of that section back to third person shooter mode and a tank that fires rockets at me excuse me and I, th I think all of the, the ta these tanks have a flamethrower each and I don't know if you can hear that. I'm going to see if I can wait it out. Because it's really annoying to have to turn it off each time. Let's see. 
Yeah, and you know, I destroy the tank. Then the street crumbles around me and heck is underneath. That's really, really cool. And you know, and, and it's that thing you have to stop and wait because not all of it will crumble and you can see what won't if you stand back for a second. And there's some jumps. And let's see, it continues happening some. And it's less jumping needed, more jumps, some tough, some not. And a big battle, with two tanks and two TIE fighters. And now you can actually shoot some of the TIE fighters down, which, you know, most of the TIE fighters in the game, I believe, you can't actually hit. And there's no boss fight, the level ends. And then a brief cutscene of this elevator between floors, music on the way, and then every time reaches a floor, door opens, and Trey guns down some enemies. And Trey reaches the thought to be dead friend protege, and I think the original player character, if I recall, it is Larry. And I thought you were dead. All right, I am because he's death. Wow, that's cheesy. And let's see, level four, death. And you know, the, you know, he says different things each time you start the level over, but. One of the times he sounds like that, yeah, I forgot to note the name, but that, that racist puppet, you know, I kill you, I kill you. And he raises glowy green zombies and shoots several of the different weapon types that I also have at me. I shoot something back. And near me spawns ammo for several different ones, but it doesn't stay around forever. And that, that's a theme with the boss fights. And he shatters the, the walls and the floor and I have to go closer to him. He has this giant scythe and he's like a hulk sized teal glowing skeleton. Most of the, I think all four horsemen at some point or another is like hulk sized or so. And most of them it's like the, the main form that they're in until you maybe eat through health or something changes. And yeah, once I kill him there's a cutscene. The place is about to go supernova, Trey says, because death tripped the reactor. And Trey jumps out of window, and that's apparently enough to be safe, I guess. And he lands on the roof, and the TIE fighters find Trey immediately. And I guess the idea is supposed to be that maybe that place, now that it's gone, the Reverend won't be able to make more horsemen, I guess, because I, I don't really remember I, it was probably said but i don't remember what it was trey said in a cutscene that was the reason for why he went there because you know obviously wasn't he wasn't expecting to find larry and he didn't know larry was a horseman so it wasn't that but yeah i guess it's something like that that yeah if if this place gets shut down then the reverend won't be able to make more and then death because he's so eager to cause death, in death, he trips the reactor, which I guess was what Trey was going to do, but because it's the, the bad guy doing it, the good guy has to jump out of a window to save his life, yeah. Level 5 rooftops, lots of explosive crates and such, a few mini tanks, a few gun emplacements, jumps, most of them easy, but I did note... I kept count 17 tough jumps in this one level. Occasional TIE fighters, some attacks, some drop spike balls, four I have to shoot down, and this is where I start meeting jetpack enemies and elevators where I have to flip a lever to use, climbing along zipline wires, and you can shoot from there, but you know, a bunch of them you can't really hit anything except maybe with heat seekers. And there are two actual zip linings in this level. Platforms that drop from under me or are exploded right behind me. And you can tell from looking which will and which won't. And the boss is just a tougher TIE fighter. I think that was the, the sound of it turning off. So, yes. Man 1, Machine 0. Let's see. And yeah, the TIE fighter is fairly easily killed. Though the machine guns are fierce. Use heat seekers and plasma to take it down. Level six graveyard, and yeah, I'm fighting zombies in a graveyard. I really feel like I'm playing medieval, and the angry dogs and you know, let's see. 
And, and those, if I recall, do a lot of damage. Mostly I didn't get hit by them, but yeah. And platforms that flip down. So you have to time it just right. And there are eight, but along the way you do get a breather. Let's see, at least one. And, and it saves right before, but not right after, so yeah. And water with whirlpools that try to suck me in. There's a tram. Grenade throw who jumps between platforms. And he can toss right in, yeah, right next to him if that's where I am. But he doesn't seem to take damage from his own grenades. So, yeah, that's something you have to keep care of. And the zombies rise from the ground in coffins. Now it really is medieval. A f you know, f if... Future, future, future evil, I guess, would, is what it would be. Blade Runner evil, something like that. And there's a few dozen grenade throwers, half to a full dozen at a time. Throw a switch, find zombies and grenadiers. And there's no boss. And level 7, Plague. And it's that thing of like, you know, th this is where you maybe realize, every single time you encounter a living person who isn't and you know one of the enemies if you know in a cutscene if you encounter a living person they're gonna be a horseman in disguise you know and yeah and and it, it was it was a pretty good transformation yeah and you know spreading rings that damage me on both sides and there are these three circles I can move around in and it really it is like a stage from a rock concert and Plague jumps around on the concert stage in front of me, weapon spawn. After I've taken some of her health, there's a disco ball light y thing in the middle circle, spinning fast, spewing three flames in sort of triangle. And no, no place is safe to stand for more than a second or so. And then every 30 seconds or so, it stops and then spins back the other way around, making it even more unpredictable. And when she has less than half her health, maybe a third left, the disco ball disappears and the circles of either side of me crumble and fall and the circle I'm on does too with just a few seconds for me to jump onto the stage and then she's like crawling on all fours and when I shoot her she bleeds green goo that boils and which is acidic to the touch and thankfully it doesn't stay around for more than a few seconds that would make it really difficult and she moves really fast and she explodes into green swirly energy like the the other horsemen when I kill her and the cutscene has me realize that a gun runner's like helping or supplying the horseman something again could make out a lot of what was said and Trey goes to his factory and you know busting a uh, candy gram and confront him as he says war cells and an elevator hidden in the floor lets him quickly slip away and Trey jumps into the hole without pausing for a second to wonder if where it lands is gonna be like safe for him at all, but yeah. And level eight war factory and two oh nines, that's awesome. And they fire these two red energy balls per shot, corridors, and this is literally a factory, you know, got electric arcs to jump over in between these large sections of wall that move. It it has this real industrial feel to it. And you, know, you jump past when they moved away, you know, definitely don't get hit by them and don't fall in the hole they move in. And you know, I'm jumping down inch by inch through a large square, wait, through a deep hole, green electric arcs to avoid along the way. And the floor at the bottom is large square and full of Ed 209s. More are dropped via see-through pipe-like harmonica things. And when they're all gone, the floor shifts and let, lets me drop down on down to another corridor. Lots of Ed 209s. Elevators, platform jumping. I take one long elevator trip up with Ed 209s dropping down three at a time in a triangle formation. And at the top, another corridor, more Ed 209s. Now I'm above some of the moving wall sections. I have to jump on top of them, move from one to the next. And thankfully there's a checkpoint right before it and another right, one right after it. An elevator moves horizontally and I have to jump over green electrical arcs, platforms with enemies on them, some jet troopers, and new areas, molten lead below, moving platforms, jumping. And 
and I crawl on a zipline wire and lots of Ed 209s and I spend all my homing missiles on them but there's a pickup for more and I get them all like that uh, moving platforms at 209s no space between platforms so it's more like steps on stairs and the floor opens up new moving platforms jet troopers a dozen or so not all at once and a cutscene has the the gun runner start to fly off in a ship and tray fires which what I guess is a homing missile and you know it lands and explodes and blows out of the sky he crashes becomes a war level 9 war Let's see, I have to destroy two auto machine guns on the outside of the ship before the rest of the level proceeds. And then it blows up, war comes out, perma flames coming from the floor up, and he fires homing missiles at me two at a time, two more every time they blow up. Have to move fast to keep them from hitting me. I leave behind fire briefly, and he fires a laser at me from side to side. After I've taken about a fourth of his health, he grows huge and starts chasing me, swinging his sword. And, you know, it's, it's the, you, you realize you have to shoot those glowy barrels to slow him down by blocking his path. And, you know, you're running backwards and for a while you, you can't accidentally run into something. But, you know, then there start being holes in the road and, you know, flames spewing out. And eventually you have to jump between platforms to... And when he touches a platform, it disappears. And not long after that, he does go down. And using smart bombs makes him a lot easier to take down. And I don't want to waste them. I may need them for beasts. So, you know, and a short cutscene highlights that War, back when he was human, said he was selling to the US president and Trey figures he must be a horseman. Feel like a tour of the White House? Which is again a line that makes a lot more sense if he was talking to the player instead of talking to himself level 10 the white house you've got the you know wiry looks like it could be electrified fence and a wide corridor outside mounted auto guns do a chunk of damage per shot for the opening area tie fighters searchlights maybe half a dozen or more and then i can see the white house and it's surrounded by lava pits that's awesome and several platform jumps later i'm running right outside the white house in this 2D side scroll perspective, platform jumping over lava next to the White House. And sometimes I make a 90 degree turn around a corner and walk along side, another side of the White House. And every so often a TIE fire will blow up some of the area that I would be walking, forcing me to do more jumping. And I get to the top of the White House and then I'm chased alongside the whole platform around corners. TIE fighters firing at the section right behind me and reach a blue force field and I like how they did this you see the blue force field before you get chased so you're like you know can can I shoot you know you're trying to shoot it with them you know with with the infinite ammo machine gun just see if you can you're trying to like touch it to see if it's thing okay can't shoot it can't you if you shoot it you're not going to do anything to it if you touch it you're not going to take damage but it is going to block your path so when you get chased you and you see it you're like okay I can't get past that and so you know you have to shoot part of the top of the building till it blows up and then jump down the hole and there's a checkpoint and i'm running around corridors inside and tie fighter blows a hole in the wall and i fight these i guess secret servicemen and they like raise their arms to like hug level and fire two fireballs at me each and the wall to the outside is blown up by a tie fighter as i run by tie fighters as i run a little later, another TIE fighter, and this one I have to destroy. It exploding creates another hole I jump down. A little down this corridor, floor, the floor explodes, lava, platforms I have to jump, lots of explosions. And, you know, this is one part where I did stop to think, maybe this is a little bit too much mayhem in just one area, considering I have to make these careful jumps. And I'm jumping between rock platforms, a bottomless pit below me, volcano shooting bursts of lava that explode into smaller blobs of lava. And after maybe a dozen jumps here, I complete the level. And the cutscene has Trey kick down the doors to the Oval Office, shoot at the president, only to hit one of the force, force fields and stab on this level. And he turns into Beast. And level one, Beast. I am the apocalypse, he says in deep voice at the start of the level. 
I use all my weapons this time since the last level, and I knew that since I'd played it before. And yeah, he immediately fires the, these twin eye lasers side to side, so I have to jump and pick carefully where to run to, to and from to dodge it. And he also uses like, like a flamethrower, breathing fire into his hand, and then creating a fireball that he throws and leaves flames, which leaves flames. And, I thought, and then I can leave the small circle of the Oval Office, and there's ammo and health pickups. And he jumps, and when landing, creates a growing circle of force from the landing, and I have to dodge or take damage from. And once I eat through his health bar, which doesn't take long for the first few weapons, he grows to be huge and fires fireballs at me. And around this time, he destroys some of the ground-making platforms. Not long after, he cuts off the paths to the platforms, with really far jumps, and that's where you have to go to get more health. And then he shrinks to Hulk size again, and now we're breathing fire side to side. And I eat through his health with large weapons, grows again, shrinks again, shooting fireballs. And I use up all my remaining ammo to eat through his health bar, and he grows another one. So, yeah. And let's see. And when you're close to him, he's gonna slash at you, but then also enables you to use your smart bombs, which, you know, yeah, to, to so that you don't have to be jumping, you know, to these platforms to get more, you know, too too often at least. And you know, every so often he'll leap away from the platforms. I wasn't entirely sure if that's just after a few seconds of standing on a platform, or if it's when I use smart bombs, but yeah. And... Yeah, and at the end he's huge, catches fire and shrinks to human size. And then the really stupid... There's a cutscene that shows the energy going from Beast to Trey, who shoots Beast with a machine gun. And I ah, thought they had me for there for a second, Trey says. And then he says, in a deep voice, Welcome to paradise, and his eyes glow red. Lame, not build up to, unsatisfying ending. I mean, even for every speaking character who becomes a horseman, it's still stupid. And nothing happened to the reverend. I mean, is it enough to stop his horseman? Couldn't he just make more? But I guess that's supposed to be the thing that by destroying, which which I didn't do, death did, but yeah, destroying the, the signs he placed that maybe he can't make more, but then, you know, the ending has him become one of the horsemen and just, I mean, if this had been something that had been set up earlier, that would have been cool. Like, if there was some kind of thing of maybe, maybe every, like, everyone who's been in contact with Trey or the Reverend, if they die, they become a horseman. And like every time you reach one of them, they like suicide or something to become a horseman. And then the last one, you know, Trey kills him, but just, you know, at the last moment he manages to, to stab Trey and you're like, did, did Trey die? And what happened, you know? And then like he, you know, starts moving in after being stabbed, and it's like, ah, oh, he made it. And then, you know, opens his eyes, eyes are red, and you're like, oh no, he became a horseman. But instead, it just, there's no buildup. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's stupid. It's super lame. It's one of the only things I don't like about this game is that ending. And, but yeah, I mean, how awesome is it that literally the game ends with you fighting your way into the White House, which is covered by lava, and like you're being attacked by TIE fighters, blowing holes in the White House, you know, you get into the Oval Office, the President of the United States himself turns out to be a freaking horseman of the apocalypse, and you have to shoot him a ton of times with these heavy weapons, and he, glow he grows to be huge, and he's shooting fireballs and lasers and just, I mean, you know, you shouldn't know that that happens going into the game because it's a, you know, it's a spoiler. You don't want to know that going in. But, I mean, I feel like maybe, maybe that was part of the pitch. 
like when they were like saying we kind of want to make this game and like the producers like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and, uh, and they they explain that that's going to be the end of the game and the producers like how much money do you need for this because you can have it just like yeah it just i mean i'm that's awesome that's just awesome and that is maybe also a thing that a game can get away with that i'm not sure an action movie could have gotten away with you know but yeah i mean that is that is just awesome that's that's exactly the way this game should end and just yeah and i mean on on plot really the first few levels is really just Trey being chased away from where, you know, first they imprison him, so he escapes from the prison, and let's see, the prison, I think, leads into the sewers, yeah, the, af after you've escaped from the prison, you have to go through the sewers to proceed, and then, like, the city, I want to say, and then he is like, okay, now I can get back to the science-y place where I work, because I need to turn it, I need to destroy my equipment so the Reverend can make more horsemen, something like that, I don't know. And, you know, he finds death there, guarding it, of course, because it's important to the Reverend. And I guess death figured that Trey is going to destroy the machine. Even if, if death doesn't destroy the machine, Trey is going to destroy it, or maybe use it and be a more difficult for the next horseman to deal with. So if he destroys it, there's a chance Trey will die too. Maybe that's the idea, I don't know. And so, yeah, after that, Trey is like, okay, it's, it's super difficult for me to do this alone. Maybe I can get help. I know, Mary. Mary would definitely be able to help. And so he fights his way through the graveyard, noting that only my Mary would be twisted enough to have what was it to to perform to yeah to have i don't know yeah to to live near a graveyard something like that you know and yeah there at the end you know you get in through the door and he's like you know okay you see what's going on can can we work together on this and yeah, yeah i know that's not literally what he's it's it's that stupid relationship -y joke of you know i you're my ex, but we used to have a good relationship. Are you still in t Which is also very diehard, honestly. You know, like, I know we broke up, but maybe we should, you know, we had a thing, maybe, yeah. And, you know, she turns into the, yeah, she's Plague, if I recall. And, and I mean, that also, you know, if you are, well, let's see, the science guy makes death, I guess, because the, the science is what created the horseman and what is making Armageddon happen, so it's leading to death. And she spreads a plague through her music, I guess. I don't know. It's it's tenuous, but I'll take it. And and like Yeah, so so yeah, he, he defeats her and then yeah, and, and he sees that I I again it went by too fast and the lines I couldn't make out. So but yeah he realizes that like I guess some of the stuff she had was bought by the from from Rafe or whatever his name was, and so he's like, okay, so I gotta stop that. He he's gonna know something about this, so he goes to the war factory, confronts Rafer, and he has to chase him down through the war factory, and yeah, obviously the the gun runner is war. That's not you know <laughs> makes sense, and. Yeah, and, and then he realizes, he said, you know, I war sells, and I sell to anyone, including the president. And then he's like, oh, I guess the president is going to be, and so he he goes to the, yeah, the, the you know, the White House, and takes out the, the president, who, of course, turns out to be Beast. And, and I don't know enough to say that if, if Beast is like, well, yeah, I mean, the number of the Beast... So, yeah, isn't Beast the devil himself, according to the Bible? I, f I forget, but the, 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 what was it? The, hmm. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so at the end there, you know, the, I mean, the White House is basically gone. 
I mean, it, it depends if, if, I mean, could Trey even make it away from there? Because he is basically trapped, surrounded by this, this hex stuff. Although, I suppose it's possible that the, that the, the horsemen are fine with lava. But I suppose if we say that they aren't and they can't fly and no one picks him up, I guess he is just stuck down there and the Reverend has lost because the Reverend needed Trey's machine to make more because Trey was the one who developed it and he's not going to develop it again. And so it's just going to be that kind of, you know, dark twist ending where he's stuck down there and he can't, like, you know, he, he it was a period victory. Well, you know, not quite, but you know, he he won, but he had to sacrifice himself, or he didn't realize, but he would be, he would end up dying at that, or becoming a horseman, and then not, yeah, I don't know. I guess if if you go by that, I guess it basically wraps up the story. Again, I I think they should have done more. There's not a single line spoken in level that I missed. So I wish that some of this stuff would be reiterated after the cutscenes. But again, that's a problem in a lot of these, you know, early console games, you know, PlayStation 1 games and such. But yeah, I suppose that wraps up the story decently enough. But I do still think that, you know, just having something, some kind of, you know, I mean, the Reverend himself we see in cutscene, but Trey never directly interacts with him, does he? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, he sh he shows. We we see him a few times in cutscenes and such, but I suppose that covers everything. But yeah, you know, despite the few negatives, I absolutely love this game. I gave it an eight out of ten in 2010, and. Yeah, it, it really is, like, from, for overall, overall quality, I'd definitely say 8 out of 10. Personal preference, I'd say I enjoyed it 11 out of 10. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.